So now we come to the second lecture, which will be given by Linda Partridge, from, uh, who will be talking to us about the future of aging. And she's uh, leading an institute on aging in uh, Germany. And so, Linda, you have the stage. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre, and I would like to add my voice to the chorus of thanks for being part of this absolutely inspirational meeting, a real feast of science, and wonderful to see so many faces here joining in, and also all the young faces. So thank you very much for including me. So, the future of aging. Schrodinger himself actually didn't make particularly old bones. He died of tuberculosis at the age of 73. But in general, we've been uh, rather good at making ourselves live longer than that. Um, it's a trend that started in the middle of the 19th century and has been going on at an extraordinarily steady rate ever since. So this is the work of two demographers. And what they've done is to plot life expectancy at birth against the year in which the birth took place for the country that was the world leader at the time. So to start with, this was the Scandinavian countries. Um, Latterly, as we'll see in a minute, it, it's been the Far East. And what you can see is this astonishing 2.5 years per decade steady increase. And it shot straight past the predictions of various individuals and organizations about where the intrinsic limit on human lifespan would turn out to be. And as well as this um, average trend in different countries, we're also seeing some astonishing outliers. I think these are two very remarkable ladies. Um, the one on the left, Jeanne-Louise Calmont, was, was a French lady, and she is the official world record holder for longevity. She died in 1997 at the age of about 122 and a half. And really, we can only speculate about why her, why she achieved this amazing feat. Um, human lifespan is somewhat heritable, probably less than 10%. It doesn't have much of a genetic basis, but she did come from a long-lived family, so that may have been part of it. Um, on the other hand, she wasn't a great advert for the kind of healthy lifestyle that we would try to advocate now. She actually gave up smoking when she was 117. <laughs> so, you know, who knows what her secret was? And the world's oldest living person now is the Japanese lady on the right, Kani Tanaka, and she's between 115 and 116. And actually, the closest anyone's got to Jean-Louis Calmont's achievement um, since she did it um, was just over 119. So there's been a lot of speculation based on the lifespans of these outliers as to whether we are actually seeing the intrinsic limit. I think it's really very hard to tell. The statistics of outliers are extremely tricky. And of course, the children who are growing up today are in very different circumstances from these ladies. I mean, in many ways, much better circumstances, less infectious disease and so on. On the other hand, the very sad outbreak of the uh, obesity uh, worldwide may have something to say about life expectancy in the years to come. But what's very clear is that the average in the countries for which there are good statistics is going to increase. So this paper came out last year in Lancet, and what we've got is for all these countries for which there are good records, women on the left, men on the right, projected life expectancy at birth in 2030. And you can see that for um, South Korea is going to be the leader for both sexes at that point. This is based on current age-specific survival rates, just projecting them into the future. So what that means is that many of the younger people in the room can actually expect to live past 100, probably about 25% of you. Um, interesting, wealth doesn't go with health. Um, you can see that the United States is fairly well down the pile here in terms of life expectancy, um, despite the amount that it can afford uh, to spend on health care. And you'll see that the x-axis here is different for women and men. In all these countries, women outlive men, but they're not healthy extra years of life. Unfortunately, women have a much longer period of illness and lack of function at the end of their lives than men do. 
So this is a major achievement of uh, civilization, as we heard from Catherine Holt, improvements in food quality, water uh, cleanliness, especially combating infectious diseases. And lastly, improvements in health amongst or in survival amongst the elderly as a result of medical care are all contributing to the trend. But what this means is that we're living way, way beyond the ages at which we died in our evolutionary past. Most people would have been dead by 40. So natural selection has not had a chance to modulate the later parts of the adult lifespan. We've never had a, that part of our life history fine-tuned by natural selection. So all sorts of things go wrong during aging, and particularly the predominant chronic and killer diseases. So dementia, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Aging is the major risk factor for all of them. These are just various um, EU and UK uh, statistics for the instance of those various diseases. And the aim of the kind of research that I and um, many others do these days is not to make people live longer. That's happening already. The aim is to try to reduce this period of ill health at the end of life. It's sometimes called compressing morbidity. The aim is to try to keep people healthy for longer before they die. And I think the major change in the subject area and the one that's pointing to its future that's happened fairly recently is the thought that because aging is the major risk factor for these conditions, perhaps we could actually intervene in the underlying aging process itself to prevent groups of diseases simultaneously because they evidently have things in common if aging is a major risk factor for all of them. That may not sound a very plausible approach, but there's really increasing evidence, I think, that it's going to be effective. I mean, for a start, it's clear that aging does have a very strong genetic basis. It can be um, changed by um, genetic variation during evolution. And we heard about this very nicely, I think, from Emma Talling. These are some of the organisms that she mentioned. So I think the mammalian record holder is the bowhead whale at about 200 years. It, it was actually aged by the age of the harpoon heads that were found embedded in the animals. And then this extraordinarily green round shark, I think, is the vertebrate record holder at almost 400 years. And given that it doesn't start breeding till it's 150, it's certainly not going to make the ideal fishery, despite its interesting biology. And then the animal record holder is this um, ocean uh, quahog, down on the bottom left here, um, at almost 500 years, it lives on the bottom of the Atlantic. And I think very important, and as Emma pointed out, um, to realize is that aging is a trait that evolves independently. It isn't just that big things live longer. There is a general correlation there, but it is just a correlation, and it's one that can be very easily broken in evolution. And I think two interesting organisms in that regard are here. The naked mole rat is a rodent. It's about intermediate in size between a rat and a mouse. Um, but it can live 30 years. And these are really interesting animals. They're very, very social. And also, like this little brand's bat that you can see sitting on a fingertip here and can live 40 years, they're cancer-free, these animals. They almost never get cancer. And at least in the case of the naked mole rat, it looks as though this is to do with the extracellular matrix of the animal. There's something that stops tumor cells actually traveling around the body of the animal. And aging actually isn't inevitable at all. There are quite a lot of organisms that seem not to age. Um, these are two of them, C. anemone on the left and hydra on the right. They're basically bags of stem cells. They can regenerate themselves. And also, interestingly, they set their germ line aside quite late in life, and that may well be relevant um, to the fact that we're non-aging. I don't really have time to say too much about these fascinating animals, but it's clear that aging can be avoided completely. So there's been a lot of interest in trying to identify some of the genes that are capable of producing these healthy lifespans that we're seeing out there in nature. And here, a rather different cast of characters has come into play, and we've heard quite a bit of uh, several of them during the course of this meeting. Uh, so single-cell yeast is very commonly used. Um, we've heard about the nematode, um, my own favorite organism, like Michael Rosbash is the fruit fly, and the mouse. And these have been real engines of biological discovery, basically because of evolutionary conservation. So we can often take a gene from one of these organisms, or even from a human, and put it into another, and the gene works just fine in its new context. 
And that has enabled us to understand principles of hereditary, the way genes are expressed, how nervous systems work, all kinds of um, biological processes. But I think there was quite serious doubt about whether this would be true of aging. These organisms live for very different lengths of time from each other, and they encounter very different stresses and strains as they go through their lives. But eventually, someone did the right experiment with the worm, uh, Cynorhabditis elegans, and simply did a mutagenesis. So this was Cynthia Kenyon. She fed the worms a chemical mutagen and asked if she could isolate long-lived worms. And she found that she could. This is one of the mutants that she isolated, survival curve here. It's called DAF2. And you can see this astonishingly long lifespan compared with the controls. And it took a while to figure out what DAF2 actually was, but eventually it was cloned and sequenced. And it turned out to be a single worm insulin-like insulin growth factor receptor. So insulin, of course, much better known from its role in mammals, where it's important in control of metabolism, blood sugar, and so on. IGF-1 known because of its role in control of growth and wound healing. And now here it is in the worm, affecting the rate at which the creature ages. And perhaps even more surprisingly, this effect of insulin IGF turned out to be evolutionarily conserved. Because subsequent work with flies, um, shown here, and mice, this is actually not the exact equivalent of DAF2. It's a different gene, the same one in the two species, in a different bit of this insulin IGF signaling network. And in this case, if you knock the gene out completely, this is a slight loss of function mutant. Here, the gene's gone completely. And in both cases, you see this nice increase in lifespan. And very importantly, this wasn't just an extension of the moribund period at the end of life. These animals stayed healthy and functional for longer. And in fact, in all three species, if you combine these mutants um, with genetic models of various human aging-related disease, so neurodegenerative disease, cancer, and so on, then they can actually combat the pathology associated with those models. So for instance, if we look at that mouse and what happens to it as it gets older, it shows an astonishingly broad spectrum improvement in health. It's just lost one gene, but we see in all these different systems an improvement in function. So as they go through middle and old age, they've got better glucose handling, um, a better immune profile, more naive T cells. Um, they stay agile and able to balance for longer, and they get less of these um, pathologies. So mice get osteoporosis, and these mutant mice get less of it. Um, you can see the cataracts on the control mice here. So these two are sisters at the age of about 850 days. And you can also see this ulcerative dermatitis on the head and neck of the control. About 40% get it as they get old. The mutants are completely protected from that skin condition. So all these different systems are showing this amazing improvement in function just as a result of losing one gene. Of course, the important question here, is this going to be of any use for humans? And the way that people are now starting to look at that is to take the equivalent genes in humans of the ones that turn out to be important in aging in the model organisms and ask whether there are specific variants, changes in sequence of the gene that are associated with survival to advanced ages, so 90, 100, and so on. And it's turning out that um, there are. So particularly um, IGF-1, um, there have been a couple of papers on that um, here and here, um, basically showing that both the expression and the sequence of the receptor gene are altered um, in humans who live a long time. This is part of the network that particularly um, senses amino acids, and again, the expression pattern associates with long lives. This FOXO3A is a very interesting gene. It's turned up in repeated studies, and what it encodes is something called a transcription factor. So that's a protein that controls the expression of lots of genes. And what this network actually does is to sense the nutritional and the stress status of the animal at the time. And it matches its costly activities, its metabolism, its growth, its reproduction to its current circumstances. And what happens if, if there is a stress or a food shortage, this FOXO3A and a lot of other transcription factors become activated. They go in and uh, start altering the expression of genes in the nuclei of cells. And it turns out that variants in that gene are repeatedly associated, particularly with survival at very late ages. <laughs> 
And one of the interesting things about humans who live to very late ages, to 100, 105, 110, is that they show progressively less and less illness at the end of their lives. So the later that people die, the less ill health they suffer before they do so. So this is, a, I think, a very interesting indication that we should be able to compress morbidity with this network. And th this signaling network mediates, and this is very well established from experimental work with all the model organisms, it mediates the effects of an environmental intervention that's been known about for a lot longer, uh, which is called dietary restriction. So it was first discovered in rodents way back in the 1930s that if you put the animal on a diet, you just force it to eat less than it would do if it was left to its own devices. And particularly with rodents, you can really do this to quite an extreme degree, you know, 60%, 50% of their normal intake. You see a really marked increase in lifespan and improvement in health. And it's since been found that all of these model and non-model organisms show a similar response. If you put them on a diet, they live longer. And very interestingly, this turns out to be uh, true in rhesus monkeys. So there have been two long-term studies in the United States um, of about 70% dietary restriction. So the animals are given about 70% of their voluntary intake. And one of them found a, a clear increase in lifespan. Um, the other didn't. But what they both found was a very marked improvement in health during aging. So all of these things were improved in the dietary restricted monkeys. They maintain their skeletal mass and their physical activity as they get old. They've got better vascularization of the heart and the brain, um, better immune function, uh, decreased accumulation of iron in the brain and less atrophy of it, and less diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. So again, this extraordinarily broad improvement in health um, from this intervention. Unfortunately, dietary restriction is not a practical public health intervention for humans. Um, there have been a number of attempts at randomized control trials to look at whether dietary restriction does benefit humans. And the results have complete, been completely limited um, by failures in compliance with the dietary regime. <laughs> Most of us just can't do it. So only 90% of normal food intake was achieved. They, they couldn't reduce it by more than 10%, and it couldn't be maintained for more than a few months in that context. There are a few individuals who voluntarily dietarily restrict themselves. Interestingly, they're mostly men, and they do show very clear improvement in, for instance, risk factors of cardiovascular disease. So it looks as though it would work, but in practice, it's not going to happen. But it turns out that much more nuanced manipulation of the diet may actually produce um, equivalent health benefits because it's very clear now that dietary restriction is just that. It's not calorie restriction. It's specific nutrients in the diet that mediate the health benefits of taking down the overall food intake. And interestingly, one of the, the main important ingredients actually turns out to be the protein in the diet and especially the essential amino acids. Um, so, to summarize the evidence from humans and mice on this, there's been a lot of work in the invertebrate model organisms as well. In humans, this is epidemiological evidence looking at people's diets and what happens to them. And it seems that up to the age of around 60, protein should be kept as low as possible in the diet. And this um, both decreases overall mortality and particularly mortality from cancer. So high-protein diets um, seem to be carcinogenic. After that, a rather different consideration kicks in because frailty and sarcopenia, so lack of muscle mass, uh, can be serious problems in the late 60s onwards. And there, it looks as though a high-protein diet is required to maintain um, muscle mass and avoid frailty. The work in the mice is experimental, and it's, it has produced rather similar results. So it's very clear that low-protein diets reduce incidence of tumors in mice, whereas when they're older, um, in order to maintain their weight and their muscle mass, again, they need a higher protein diet. So diet composition may be modifiable. And as we heard from Michael, also when you eat the food uh, really matters. This is the experiment um, that he was talking about, which was done with mice. Um, at the moment, we don't have data on humans for this. Um, but the people were working with um, both ordinary, just wild-type mice, and this um, genetically obese mice, which has problems with the leptin system and feedback um, from the fat, so it eats too much. 
And what they did was to do this um, time-restricted feeding. So they allowed the mice to feed for eight hours in the dark period, because mice are nocturnal, so that's when they're normally active and when they eat. And what they found was very interesting. The mice didn't eat different amounts, so restricting the time during which the mice could get its food didn't make it eat less or more. The total intake was the same. It was simply that the timing was different. And what they found was that in the obese mice, um, they, if they were allowed to eat whenever they liked, um, what they became was morbidly obese. And if they were time restricted, they were still rather large. But now their metabolic indicators um, were much more healthy. And rather similarly with the lean mice, um, they became obese if they could eat when they liked, but with time-restricted feeding, they were lean and fit. And then, for reasons known only to the experimenters, they also included a group um, where they were allowed to have the weekend off. So they were time-restricted <laughs> during the week. And actually, they, they got almost exactly the same metabolic outcome as doing it seven days a week, so you don't even have to do it all the time. So I think these nuanced interventions may be... Um, the way to go. And um, the World Health Organization is uh, having a big drive at the moment um, to try to prevent premature mortality and to keep people healthier for longer, partly by modulation of diet, but also exercise. Uh, there was an estimate yesterday that 1.3 billion people in the world aren't taking enough exercise, and of course, quitting smoking. So there are modifiable factors that can keep people healthier as they go through aging. But I think there are also some very interesting messages starting to come on stream from what we've learned about the biology of aging from work with animals. And this is only just starting, but I think it's the way of the future. And one of these is preventative drugs, um, very similar to the use of statin and blood pressure-lowering medication at the moment to try to prevent cardiovascular disease, but in this case, trying to prevent um, the impact of aging. Now, there would be huge challenges for de novo drug development um, to try to prevent aging. Um, I've listed some of it here. So if we simply want to keep people healthier for longer and we want them to take a pill to achieve that, there's going to be a big issue about how long the treatment has to be done for. Can we start in late age? Does it have to be in middle age, even with young people? And of course, if a drug is going to be used in a broad population sense and for a long period, it has to be really, really safe. The regulators are going to be very interested if it's anything to do with aging, because until extremely recently, aging has bizarrely not been recognized as a disease. And of course, there's the pharmaceutical industry. They need to be able to make money out of it if they're going to invest in the R&D that's going to produce the drug. So I think there are difficulties with de novo drug development. Of course, this doesn't stop people flogging things to... Um, try to prevent aging. If you go into any drugstore, you'll see all sorts of stuff on the shelf that is supposed to prevent aging. But I think we now actually have a rather better evidence base for this. So this is a cartoon of the signaling network that I've been talking about, the insulin IGF. So what we have is circulating ligands, which are in the blood system and can communicate between tissues. The receptor sitting in the cell surface and then various proteins in the cell that convey the signal to these transcription factors that I've mentioned that are either activated if things are not going well for the organism or outside the nucleus and inactive if there's plenty of food and no stress. And as you would expect for a network that's very important in the aging process, it's also very important in age-related disease. So mutations in many of the genes that encode these various proteins um, have turned out to be um, important risk factors for cardiovascular disease, for cancer, for neurodegeneration. So the network has already been hammered by the pharmaceutical industry, and there are a large number of drugs against various targets in it for specific conditions. And an interesting one here that's being a lot studied in the field is called rapamycin. So it's a licensed drug, and it's used to prevent um, rejection of tissues after transplant, particularly kidneys, um, to keep heart arteries clear after surgery, and it's also, also an anti-cancer um, chemotherapeutic. And interestingly, it turns out to increase lifespan. Um, these are some data for flies um, showing rapamycin at different um, doses and the survival curve. Um, the drug was actually discovered in a microorganism in the soil on Rapa Nui, um, hence this cover here. And we've learned an awful lot from work 
with Drosophila, which is where these survival curves have come from, about the mechanisms um, by which rapamycin increases lifespan. But interestingly, it also does so in mice. So survival curves are shown here for females and for males with different doses of the drug. You can see that there's a bit of a sex difference here. It works better in females than in males. And that's actually true of a lot of these anti-aging interventions. They're often to some degree sex-specific, uh, which is interesting and sometimes tells us a little bit about how they work. Um, but clearly, it's working as an anti-aging drug here. And interestingly, in a lot of mo um, animal models of age-related diseases, rapamycin has turned out to be protective, particularly against neurodegenerative disease. So models of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease. It can really ameliorate the symptoms. And uh, just this year, in fact, only a couple of months ago, this paper came out in Science Translational Medicine. So old people and old mice respond very poorly to immunization against influenza. They show a very uh, weak immune response. And it was originally shown in mice, actually, that if you give them rapamycin, it, it makes them show a much better response um, to the immunization. And this group from uh, Novartis have just shown the same thing in the elderly. So what they did in this um, clinical trial was to get a group of elderly people and either pre-treat them with rapamycin or not. They then allowed them to clear the drug and then immunize them against flu. And they saw a better immune response. Uh, they could measure the antibodies and so on, and the different cell classes that respond to it. Um, but the ones who had been pre-treated with rapamycin also got fewer respiratory infections in the ensuing winter. So it seems to potentiate the effect of immunization. And this may well extend to other um, infectious diseases. Um, they're looking at that at the moment. So a lot of interest in rapamycin. Um, also in this drug metformin. Um, so metformin also targets this insulin signaling network. It actually probably has more than one target in the network. And it's the drug that's always used now as the first line of defense against type 2 diabetes when it's first diagnosed. And it's now the subject of a clinical trial in the US which has one very interesting feature, which is that the condition is aging. So the FDA are now recognizing it as an outcome in a clinical trial. And the idea here is to get a group of healthy elderly, give them metformin, and look at the development of a, a whole series of conditions subsequently. And the trial was permitted simply because metformin is such an extremely safe drug. It has an excellent safety profile. So it's a good one to start with. So I think these are the drug possibilities, but there are also some other important discoveries that are further over the horizon, but just coming online. So one of these is targeting cellular senescence. So a very regular feature of aging is the presence of senescent cells. Normally they're there during development to remodel tissues, but they, and they're also involved in wound healing. But they accumulate during aging. Normally they're cleared by macrophages, but that goes wrong during aging and they accumulate and they cause tissue damage. And they're involved in the etiology of several diseases, one of which is osteoarthritis. Um, and it's been shown in mice now that if you remove senescent cells using something called a senolytic, you can greatly improve joint function, and also if the joint is injured, um, it recovers much better than um, if the senescent cells are present. And people are already thinking about treating kidneys for transplant with senolytics to remove the senescent cells before they're transplanted. So early, early days, but it's looking very interesting. Um, another one is this systemic factors in the blood. So these were originally discovered with um, Frankenstein-type experiments where the blood supplies of the mice were conjoined. Um, so what they did was to either join um, young to young or old to old as control, but then you can do this heterochronic pairing where you've got a young joined to an old mice, so they're experiencing each other's systemic blood factors. And it turned out that for the old mice, this produced a really great improvement in the function of several different tissues, brain, muscle, bone, kidney, for instance. Um, and increasingly, the factors that are present in the systemic blood supply are being identified. Some of them are bad things in old mice, which are not so useful. But recently, it's been shown that plasma from the umbilical cord in humans um, transplanted into mice or inoculated into mice um, can actually improve synapse formation in the brain in old mice. So again, a lot of interest in that. 
And the final one, um, we've heard a little bit about the gut microbiome. We're all walking ecosystems. We've got this huge diversity and number of bacteria in our guts, on our skin, and so on. And it's very clear that the microbiome in the gut and its composition is a very important determinant of health, and it changes during aging. And this experiment just came out actually last, last month, um, showing that if you take, um, they call them calorie-restricted, but um, dietarily restricted mice, um, it, what you can do is to inoculate the gut microbiome, either from a calorie-restricted or a fully-fed mouse, into a mouse that's had its microbiome killed. And what they found was that if the new microbiome came from the dietarily restricted mice, then they see a big increase in insulin sensitivity, the fat that's present browns, this means it becomes metabolically more active and tends to burn off excess calories. And also the liver was healthier. There was less um, fatty liver in the mice that received the transplant from the dietarily restricted mice. And of course, blood and the gut microbiota are very accessible. They're particularly promising targets for interventions. So I think the way all this is going is that people are thinking about targeting aspects of the aging process itself to prevent diseases of aging. And I think that also from the health economic point of view, um, there are going to be big advantages to doing this. People are really starting to think hard about preventing diseases before they arise, as opposed to treating them once they've arisen. So to summarize, I think the major discovery is the malleability of the aging process. Lifestyle can do a lot. The emerging opportunities include pharmacological suppression of that nutrient signaling network, removal of senescent cells, rejuvenating systemic factors, and a healthy gut microbiome. And I think we might be able to prevent aging-related disease by one or more of these routes. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>